First of all, we'd like to thank uh, Bayer for sponsoring this special lunch talk. Um, so Dr. Brophy is a clinician <coughs> investigator at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute and an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Faculty of Medicine at the University of Ottawa. He's a specialist in the field of pe pediatric and infectious disease and his main research interest is in pediatric and neonatal HIV. He has several Canadian Institute of Health Research funded multi-center studies across Canada as well as a high HIV preference uh, country. He is the current chair of the Canadian Pediatric AIDS Research Group and the Canadian Institute uh, of Health Research. Um, Canadian HIV trial member investigator and he's also the pediatric HIV clinical advisor with the uh, Clinic Health Access Initiative in Vietnam. <laughs> so without further ado, please welcome Dr. Jason Bird. Thanks very much, uh, and I'd also like to thank Bayer for sponsoring uh, me to come talk to you today. Um, I've been working with uh, veterinarians here at uh, Guelph uh, for some time. Uh, Andrew Peregrine and I uh, and Scott Weiss had worked on uh, multiple uh, applications to do some zoonotic infection research. Uh, back when I was uh, still a fellow in training at uh, the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. And since then, we've continued to have some fruitful collaborations. And I was saying this morning that I, I think I might have potentially missed my calling. I find every time I come here, I'm like, this is so cool. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was reminded this morning that I only have one animal. You have like at least six and many, many more species that you get to, to deal with every day. So uh, I think veterinary medicine is fascinating. Um, but my purpose for being here today uh, is to talk to you a bit about um, the, the interface between human and, and animal medicine. Um, we talk about this concept of One Health, which I'm sure all of you hear a lot more about than we do in human medicine. But I think it's a, an excellent concept for thinking about how we need to address uh, public health issues uh, in general, not just by species. And so my t title for my talk today is uh, Vets and Physicians Working Together to Reduce Zoonotic Disease Risk. And, and what I wanted to do during this talk is to uh, help us understand a few of the high-risk humans and high-risk pets uh, with respect to zoonotic infection risk, uh, discuss some common zoonotic infection case scenarios. So I'll share with you uh, five or six cases. I, I don't know if veterinary medicine is the same, but in human medicine, when we give talks, if it's just a bunch of didactic slides, it gets a little boring. But when you talk about cases, it's, it, it's often a lot more interesting, and people tend to remember that better. Um, I want to have a, a specific focus on bites and bite prevention, because I think this is one of the most common things we see in human medicine that is relevant to you guys, and, and also introduce a few resources on this topic. I'm a reasonably informal speaker, so if anyone has any questions or uh, if I'm saying something that isn't uh, vet speak or it's too human medicine speak, stop me and tell me. I'd rather uh, clarify uh, than have you not understand. So we'll start off with a case. Um, so, uh, and this is a, a patient that I s actually saw. A five-year-old girl with leukemia, and the leukemia was recently diagnosed uh, in the past year. She was admitted to hospital with abdominal pain, diarrhea, and fever, and she had received chemotherapy eight days before. And the parents were told that she would become neutropenic, uh, and that's common with he chemotherapy is usually about one to two weeks after chemotherapy, uh, the person's neutrophils and platelets and hemoglobin will begin to drop. Uh, and they were told to watch closely for fever because that would be a high-risk time when they, she was neutropenic. Uh, on admission, she had no ill contacts, uh, that she volunteered, uh, or the family volunteered, and no possible contaminated food ingestions. Uh, when they examined her, she was febrile, tachycardic, normal blood pressure, respiratory rate, and oxygen saturations, but really had a very tender belly on exam, <coughs> and had blood and urine cultures taken, uh, as well as stool for bacterial and viral cultures, um, and Clostridium difficile uh, testing. So, Patients like this are in the hospital a lot. They receive a lot of antibiotics. They're at risk for Clostridium difficile infection uh, and uh, the colitis that kind of accompany that. So she was admitted to hospital as a case of febrile neutropenia. 
and started on broad spectrum IV antibiotics, including antibiotics to the an antibiotic metronidazole to cover Clostridium difficile infection. And after 48 hours, she had improved on those antibiotics with respect to her fever and her diarrhea. Um, but her blood cultures and stool cultures both grew salmonella and enterica. Uh, and so the oncologist and the infectious disease service, we both <coughs> re-questioned the family and learned that there was a new family pet named Gary, who was a turtle. <laughs> and so uh, the story was that the child's older sister had acquired a turtle two months previously. And the family recalled having been advised not to acquire any new pets after their da daughter's diagnosis, but things don't always go as recommended. <laughs> uh, and they thought that they had adequately protected their child, their ill child with leukemia by restricting her contact with the turtle. They kept the turtle only in the sister's room and the, the girl with leukemia was not allowed to touch the animal. But the sister had developed a mild diarrheal illness two weeks after getting the turtle and the family cleaned the turtle's t tank in the bathtub that the, ch that the child was bathed in and the, both girls were regularly bathed together in the same bathtub. And so really the take home lessons from this kind of case, and this is not an uncommon case at all. <coughs> this is a, a case where something bad happened, but there are lots and lots of near misses where you ask questions, you learn stuff going on at home that's probably not a good idea, and you can thankfully get to address it earlier. But uh, what we learn from these this kind of case is that counseling isn't always effective. Uh, and in this case, the parents either didn't recall to the advice or they didn't adhere to the advice they were given. Because in our practice, when oncologists make a diagnosis of leukemia or other malignancy and the patient's going to be immune suppressed, they're usually counseled not to get rid of pets, uh, we're, we're not cruel, uh, but they're advised not to get new pets uh, if they can avoid it and to avoid high-risk pets if they're going to get a new pet. So avoiding juvenile animals, avoiding things like reptiles. <laughs> um, and so that's, uh, that's advice that, has been, uh, that we try to give out. Um, secondly, the family didn't volunteer the information about the new pet at the time of admission, leading to a late delayed diagnosis. So this suggests that uh, A, the family didn't appreciate that this was a risk that they had, that they had uh, introduced by acquiring this new pet. And so it reinforces for us on the medical end that we really need to ask a good animal contact history. So I always do that because <laughs> I'm the infectious disease doctor. Uh, and I'm interested in it, obviously, because I'm here today talking to you. Um, but not everyone knows what a good animal contact history means uh, and what would be high-risk practices uh, that we should be looking for. And finally, uh, another really good take-home lesson is that despite no direct contact with the pet, the risk of disease transmission was still there, especially for a high-risk individual like this patient. So first, uh, there could easily be contaminated hands uh, after dealing with the, the, the turtle or dealing with uh, stool from the older sister, uh, and that those contaminated hands could lead to contaminating the ill child during food preparation or routine child care. Uh, there was Definitely a potential for contamination of shared space in the bathtub by washing the habitat, the animal's ha habitat in that space. And finally, there's close contact with the sister by sharing the bathtub, and she may well have been asymptomatically shedding salmonella in her stool uh, because it hadn't been diagnosed and identified as part of the, the girl's initial illness. So I think this is a good case that kind of reinforces how we really need to be vigilant about these kinds of risks. So when we talk about zoonotic infection, it's defined as the transmission of infection between animals, <coughs> and sometimes it's, it's uh, narrowed in specifically to vertebrate animals, to humans. And the vast assortment of potential, there are a vast assortment of potential pathogens and animal associations. And this really is an important issue. Uh, when you, a paper in 2001 suggested that of the over 1,400 known species of infectious agents, viruses, parasites, bacteria included, uh, that, that are known to cause disease in humans, 61% were zoonotic. And when you think about emerging infections globally, most of the time, these are zoonotic diseases. Uh, and we can only look, we only have to look back at the last 10 or 15 years to, to see that. SARS uh, is a zoonotic infection. Uh, H1N1 and H5N1, hantavirus, MERS-CoV. And the list 
will continue to go on. And as you go out into your practice, we're going to learn more and more about additional new infections. While wild animals are a major source with respect to these emerging diseases, uh, and domestic animals as well, pets are, remain an important vector or potential reservoir of disease. Here in Canada, over 50% of families own a pet. One third have one or more cats. One third have one or more dogs. And so, these, uh, so this is a, an important uh, risk factor for infection in those households. And often infections are acquired from animals that are acquired from animals are due to their own normal flora. So I usually ask when I'm taking a, a, a zoonotic disease history, um, uh, do you have a pet? Is it old or is it a new pet? Uh, is it a pet that's a juvenile under 6 to 12 months? Uh, and is the pet ill in any way? Did they, did they have diarrhea or skin infections, stuff like that? Uh, but it's important to recognize that often these infections aren't f causing a problem in the animal. It's, that they're, it's their own normal flora in the, in the mouth, uh, in the GI tract. And so uh, we need to be vigilant that even a well pet can still have the potential to transmit a pathogen. So in addition to routine or standard pets, uh, the rate of non-traditional pet ownership has increased in recent years. And that brings with it the potential for new exposures to novel or less common pathogens. When we talk about non-traditional pets, these are de defined as imported or non-native species, or species that originally were non-native but are now bred here in North America. Uh, it also includes indigenous wildlife, so keeping a raccoon or a uh, koi dog, like a uh, coyote uh, dog hybrid. And these kinds of animals, uh, because some of them are new uh, and weren't traditionally pets, we may not recognize the zoonotic disease risk, at least in the human medicine realm. Probably the, in the veterinary realm, it's better known. But things like hedgehogs carry a risk for salmonella, uh, pigs carry a, a risk for strep suis. the list goes on. And so this is a list of all the different non-traditional pets uh, that uh, we recognize, and there set, certainly seems to be an uptick in the level of reptile ownership. Uh, and when I was in medical school, this was not something we, we talked about, and it wasn't something that my friends had a lot of, but certainly in recent years, it seems as though reptiles and amphibians in particular uh, there seems to be a lot more uh, ownership as pets. And so non-traditional pets pose a potential risk of both infection and injury. Uh, sometimes they're caught in the wild and ra rather than bred in captivity, and so you know better than me that wild animals are less predictable than domesticated animals they are, and, uh, with regards to unpredictable behavior and also in risk, increased risk of having potential pathogens they acquired in the wild. Among non-traditional pets, like, like the case demonstrated, reptiles pose a particular risk because of the high carriage rates of salmonella species, which are intermittently shed in their stool. We do have guidelines for the prevention of zoonotic infection on, on the human end, and I'm sure that you share with your, uh, with your uh, families and their pets uh, who have pets certain zoonotic infection prevention guidelines. Hand washing is really key. And for younger children, less than five years, that hand washing should be supervised. We don't trust children to wash their hands properly at that age. Um, uh, no, not keeping animals or letting animals be where food or drinks are prepared or consumed. Uh, maintaining a healthy animal, making sure they're having regular follow-up with uh, you guys uh, to ensure that they're healthy. Um, proper cleaning and disinfecting after an animal in the environment, so scoop and poop. Poop, stoop and scoop and poop. <laughs> um, uh, and I think, I don't know about the rest of you, when I was a kid, I don't think I ever saw anyone pick up any poop <laughs> of, of an animal. I grew up in the country, mind you, um, but nowadays it's pretty common practice. And then high-risk individuals should not handle high-risk animals. And th these include, again, reptiles and amphibians, but also rodents, ferrets, baby poultry or animal-derived pet treats. And although we like to kiss our pets, we probably shouldn't. <laughs> At least not on the mouth. And so this is, I've, I've talked a lot about stuff that you know already, but uh, from my end, what humans are considered high risk for zoonotic disease? When we look at the literature, there are a few key groups that we identify as high risk for zoonotic infection. Uh, 
The extremes of age are the most common. So children less than five, especially infants uh, and newborn, infants less than a year and newborns especially. And elderly over 65 years of age. Uh, we also worry about immune compromised patients uh, and the, the range of immunocompromised nowadays is very broad and increasingly broader as we have more and more uh, types of immune suppressants, <coughs> many of them specific for certain diseases. Uh, and really, we, it's hard for us to keep up and understand what, it, what do these different immune suppressants convey in terms of uh, zoonotic disease risk or risk of infection in general. I'll give you one example of that. Um, so the, with uh, the tumor necrosis factor antagonists, TNF antagonists, like infliximab or Remicade is the, the first one. These are very commonly used immune suppressants for common conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, and inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's or colitis. Uh, and they carry with them a specific increased risk for both mycobacterial diseases, like tuberculosis, uh, but also uh, um, the mycobacterium uh, marinum, which can be, can be associated with um, uh, aquaria uh, and, and contact with uh, water, water dwelling animals, uh, and also for fungal diseases like histoplasma and blastomyces. Uh, so these are things that obviously will have some relevance to you guys. And finally, the other high risk group that we talk about is pregnant women. So I'll, I'll come back and give you a few more cases because I think the cases make the point uh, better than me talking. Uh, so the second case, a 10 year old boy, previously well, referred to my clinic with a history of fever, arthralgia and rash for three weeks. The fever initially uh, was just for the first few days up to 39 degrees and then on the third day he also developed a rash uh, which was quite diffuse including his palms and soles and in humans that carries with it a certain ca uh, categories of diseases that you don't count if it's not on the palms and soles. He also started to complain of right shoulder pain uh, but there was no swelling or limitation of, uh, in the range of motion of his shoulder. On the fifth day of fever, he, his joint pains migrated to his left shoulder and his right ankle, and his right ankle was red, hot, and swollen. He was seen by his family doctor who sent blood work, which showed a normal CBC but high inflammatory markers. They also did some screening tests for rheumatologic diseases because of his joint complaints uh, with an ANA for lupus and a rheumatoid factor for uh, rheumat uh, rheumatoid arthritis. At that point, these, so these investigations were somewhat reassuring. His rash began to resolve and his joint pains persisted, but then he also developed migratory bilateral knee pain and then his left elbow and his left wrist. And by the 14th day, the fever and rash were gone, but his joint pains were persisting. On the 23rd day of his illness, his fever came back again and his left ankle became red, warm and swollen and he was, he was unable to bear weight. After that, the, the mother took the child back to see the family doctor, and mom requested to be sent to the infectious disease clinic after an internet diagnosis suggested, the <laughs> an internet search suggested the diagnosis. Usually we cringe when we see those kinds of <laughs> referrals in our mailbox because there's lots of stuff on the internet that you may or may not want to trust. So when he came to my clinic, he was not unwell, but he was still febrile. Uh, he had a, a flow murmur, uh, uh, grade two to three out of six systolic ejection murmur over the left lateral sternal border. Uh, he had no hepatosplenomegaly. Uh, he had some rash, red, red maculopapules on the upper and lower extremities, his belly and his buttocks. He had one painful red nodule on his left palm and he had a minimally swollen left ankle. So can anyone guess what she Googled? It's a zoonotic infection talk, so there's a pet involved. <laughs> so the history revealed that the family had recently acquired three pet rats, one for each of the three children in the family, and the patient's rat was definitely the most affectionate. Uh, he enjoyed climbing on his shoulders, scratching his neck. He never bit him, but he licked his ne neck a lot. He was very affectionate. And so the mother searched for rat and fever and arthritis, <laughs> and Google told her that uh, this could be rat bite fever. And if you look at the symptoms of rat bite fever, they matched this child's symptoms 
Exactly. So the family doctor hadn't heard of rat bite fever, <laughs> but the mother found it. And so rat bite fever can be caused by two different kinds of bacteria, Streptobacillus maniliformis or Sprillia minus. And in humans, it's characterized with an abrupt onset of fever, chills, muscle pain, vomiting, and headache. A maculopapular or particular rash uh, follows, predominantly on the extremities, including the soles and palms. A non-separative migratory polyarthritis or arthralgia follows in 50% of cases, and it has a relapsing course up and down over approximately three weeks. So they this child practically read the book in terms of the symptoms that he presented with. Um, and so we empirically started him on treatment uh, uh, with ampicillin and gen or penicillin and gentamicin, and he promptly improved. It's a very difficult pathogen to identify. We tried to culture his blood uh, in multiple different ways to, to confirm the diagnosis, uh, and we weren't able to confirm it in this case. Uh, about three, I saw this patient probably seven or eight years ago, uh, and we had another patient probably a year or two ago that had the exact same story, and we were able to culture the um, Streptobacillus maniliformis from both his blood and from a, a pustule on his palm, or I'm not sure exactly where it was, but we aspirated a pustule on his palm and, and grew the bacteria. And so this is, you've heard about the two cases I've seen now. <laughs> so it's not very common, uh, but it's definitely uh, a classic presentation. The next case is a 12-year-old girl with spina bifida, and she had a Mitrofenoff procedure for neurogenic bladder. Does this exist in the animal world? I don't know. So Mitrofenoff procedure is where they take a piece of the small bowel and they use it to augment the neurogenic bladder. So the neurogenic bladder doesn't squeeze the urine properly, so it sits there and they often will get, they have a high risk for urinary tract infections. Uh, and so the Mitrofenoff, uh, basically they rebuild the bladder using small bowel and they also take the appendix and bring it out to the surface through the umbilicus. As someone who doesn't like belly buttons. I really, <laughs> really, really don't like seeing these patients. They're very nice, but it's not my thing. Um, and basically, they, they catheterize themselves through this, uh, this uh, appendix origin um, a conduit to the bladder <clears throat> several times a day. Works very well for them. So this 12-year-old girl had had this procedure. And she presented with fever, nausea, vomiting, and a change in her urine in that it was more foul and more mucousy. People who have Mitrofenoff said very mucousy urine because it's from the bowel, and, and bowel makes mucus. A urinalysis was done when she came to hospital. It showed nitrites and leukocytes, so suggestive of, of a urinary tract infection. And so she was admitted to hospital uh, because of she had fever uh, and also because she was a complicated patient with an abnormal urinary tract and empirically started on ampicillin and gentamicin. So the following day, her urine culture result showed a possible, was show, showed possible capnocidophaga species. And usually this is associated with dog bites. So this is, the, this is the point where the pediatrician usually calls and says, I've never heard of this bacteria. <laughs> Can you come see this patient? Uh, and I said, I know that bacteria. Um, and so they went back to the patient to ask if there was any contact with dogs, and the patient admitted to having a dog and to letting it lick her metropolitan off site. <laughs> yes, all of your faces are exactly what my face did <laughs> when I heard that, <laughs> because I don't like belly buttons. Um, <laughs> and so the next day, the lab actually confirmed that the pathogen wasn't Capnocytophaga, it was Pasteurella, which is usually associated with cat mouths and cat bites. Uh, but can also be found in the mouths of dogs and many other animal species. And so this patient recovered and she received a terse lecture from me on proper, <laughs> proper care of her metrophenone. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, next case. So a mother took her four-month-old shopping uh, and returned home and was removing the groceries from her car while the child was still in the car seat in the back of the car. She, mom took some, uh, some bags of groceries into the house and we came back out and found the child crying and found a feral cat that had been hanging around their house exiting the car very, very quickly. Uh, the child was found to have scratches at the base of her third digit with a puncture wound in the distal phalanx. <laughs> this is not the cat, uh, but I thought she was represented. Um, so the child was taken to the family doctor and she was given a tetanus shot. Uh, the wound was cleansed and she started empirically on clavulin. 
And I have to give it up to this family doctor that that's exactly the right management and they, and they did the right thing. And I'll tell you a bit more about um, empiric management of bites a little later. The cat, unfortunately, was, I, I asked, what happened, what happened to the cat? I was thinking we need to test the cat for rabies because that's kind of an odd thing to do for a cat to attack a child um, who didn't provoke it. Uh, and the, I was told that the cat had met his maker um, and uh, the body, but, and I said, ah, uh, they said, but the, but the public health people came and collected the, the body and took the brain and examined it and it was, and it was negative for rabies. So this does not usually happen. <laughs> I do not endorse this. I do endorse looking for rabies, but uh, this family took it into their own hands. But fortunately for the child, uh, it, it turned out uh, that there was no rabies risk. Uh, the child did develop fever though and was irritable and had diarrhea which was attributed to the antibiotics and the finger actually became swollen and started uh, oozing green yellow discharge. She completed a two week course of clavulin but the finger was still swollen and red uh, and so the antibiotics were continued by the family doctor and they were referred to my clinic. And when I saw her the, the finger was still quite a bit swollen and a bit red but the child was otherwise well. So I sent her for an x-ray and it basically showed a mixed lytic process involving uh, the middle phalanx, the right third digit. So this is normal bone, and this is bone that has uh, a lytic process going on. Um, and this is another view and another view. And you can see there's almost even some displacement. And so uh, I admitted her at that point as a probable osteomyelitis or bone infection secondary to a cat bite. I had my plastic surgery colleagues see her and they felt that the x-ray was appear uh, appearance was consistent with both uh, infection but also a displaced fracture of the middle phalanx. And so this child ended up getting IV therapy for one week uh, and then another 11 weeks of oral clavulin thereafter because we treat uh, subacute bone infections and, acute and chronic bone infections much longer than we would treat uh, an acute bone infection. And because this had gone on for a while, uh, I, I thought it was necessary. So at this point, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to bites. They're really a major infectious risk with pets. Um, in terms of the number of bites per number of dog, or pets uh, per number of families, I can't say that this is a major uh, public health risk, but it's something that requires individualized uh, <coughs> advice uh, to prevent. It's a common entity, 4. million bites per year in the US, 800,000 medical visits per year, uh, which accounts for up to 1% of ER visits. Most of these are dog bites, about 80% uh, in most reviews, uh, followed by cat bites, and that third pesky animal, humans. Uh, and they each have a, a certain uh, set of characteristics that are important for us to recognize, uh, because they carry with them different risks for complications. Dog bites are usually amongst young people. The majority are under 20 years old, and the majority are males. Uh, Children are more likely to sustain bites on the face, head, or neck, and as a result of that are more likely to die of the attack. This is rare, but certainly happens. And the reason uh, for them having more head and neck uh, bites is because of their size. So <laughs> if you have a German Shepherd who's this tall and a child who's this tall, then the neck is exactly uh, in the right line of fire. Uh, in general, bites are more, more commonly involved the upper extremities, though. Uh, and then the lower extremities, face and trunk. And because dogs have more, um, more grinding teeth and, and larger teeth, they more commonly cause crushing injuries and lacerations. This is in contrast to cats, uh, who tend to, because their teeth are long <laughs> and slender, uh, they tend to, to bite through. Sadly, <laughs> some, some stereotypes have basis in truth. <laughs> so, yeah. Young middle-aged women are the most <laughs> common <laughs> victims of cat bites. <laughs> All those lonely nights at home on Friday <laughs> night. <laughs> uh, and they, cat bites tend to occur more commonly on the hands uh, because you can think, oh, nice cat, nice cat, nice cat, devil cat. Um, uh, and then followed by arms, lower extremities, face, and trunk. And like I said, the, they, they more commonly, because the, 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 so, the nature of their teeth that are longer and more slender uh, and pointy, they tend to cause more puncture wounds and scratch wounds. And this carries with it a greater risk of 
uh, invasion into the bone, like with this child. Uh, and so uh, what can seem to be a reasonably minor cat bite, because it's a very small entry point, can actually go very deep and cause a lot more problems. If it penetrates the bone or it penetrates the joint, then it's much more likely to cause a more substantial infection that needs more aggressive treatment. So this is a, a uh, pictorial uh, showing where the most common uh, areas for dog bites and cat bites. And you can see that the majority of both occur on the hands. And that's like, nice dog, nice dog, <laughs> not nice dog. Uh, and then human bites, the third dangerous animal. Um, uh, these are typically fight bites. And that's where this kind of thing happens. The guy didn't mean to bite him, but <laughs> his teeth kind of got in the way of his fist. Uh, and so the puncher is the one who sustains the bite wound to his hand. Uh, I say he because if we're going to talk about stereotypes, then it's mostly men. Um, and these more like have a higher likelihood of delayed presentation, and subsequent infection, and potential for joint involvement. Because let's let's throw out the, the other stereotype. It's usually when they're drunk, and so they don't recognize that it's a big problem until the next morning. And so, with respect to the risk of bite wound infections. Uh, dog and human bites are, the high, are lower risk in terms of about 10 to 15 percent risk of infection overall. Uh, but cat bites have an up to 50 percent risk of infection uh, with complications including abscesses, uh, bone joint involvement like I talked about already, sepsis, endocarditis, meningitis, and brain abscess. In terms of high risk patients, we, we think about risk in, terms, uh, in three ways. High risk patients, high risk uh, interactions like bites and then high risk situations. And so the high risk patients are again the, el the older and younger, so over 50 for bites and less than two years, uh, immunosuppressed, asplenics are known to have a, a specific risk for a cap capnocytophaga infection, um, alcohol alcoholism and chronic liver disease, diabetes mellitus, um, vascular disease, pre existing edema, and prosthetic and joint, val joint valves or joints. Um, there are high risk bites, so again, talking about puncture wounds and cat bites, crush injuries with devitalized tissue, uh, bone and joint proximity, hand, foot, face, and genital wounds, and, and primarily closed wounds. So if they come to the eMERGE and they have their wound closed right away, uh, then that sometimes can carry a higher risk for infection. And then high risk situations, such as delayed treatment. Um, and I put this. Uh, I put that case in this point because I actually contacted uh, Scott Weiss and, and Andrew Peregrine here uh, to ask their help because I knew from uh, my interactions with you guys that uh, staph pseudintermedius is one of the pathogens that can be seen in animal bites and animal mouths uh, and in our human labs that is, an, that is a pathogen that would not be picked out as, um, as pathogenic. Uh, it would be seen as a coagulase negative staph uh, species and we wouldn't really appreciate it as, um, as a potential pathogen and it can be quite resistant uh, and not respond to antibiotics. So this child, I was involved because we always get involved with any open brain injury uh, because it will need prophylactic antibiotics. Uh, the evidence isn't great for that but we do it because we don't want to have a trial <laughs> to look and see if we're right or not. Um, and so I, I swabbed this animal's mouth and sent it here to see if there was any carriage of staph pseudintermedius or MRSA or other pathogens. Um, but in general, bite microbiology reflects two things, the oral flora of the animal and the skin flora of the, around the bite. And so in that way, there, it's often a polymicrobial infection. Uh, we talked already about pasteurella species being the most common bacteria for both cat and dog bites. Uh, Capnocytophaga is more associated with dogs, uh, but we can also see strep and staph, staph pseudintermedius, anaerobes, which are very common in the mouth, uh, and then Iconella corrodens is kind of the human equivalent of capnocytophaga in that it's something that's usual, usually in human mouths uh, that can cause infection. And then there are special situations, and so this isn't the standard, uh, but different strange animals and, and interactions with strange animals uh, can, can have been associated with more unusual pathogens. So there have been cases of blastomyces or blastomycosis, which is an environmental fungus common here in Ontario uh, and in other parts of North America, uh, associated with dog bites. And this is usually a soil pathogen, so you can imagine the dogs rooting around in the soil, 
and then bite somebody with the soil on their mouth and they're introducing this fungal infection, which wouldn't be your typical bite pathogen. Uh, we think about tularemia, erysipelothrix, which is an, a fish pathogen, uh, and Bartonella uh, in association with cat bites. Strap Streptobacillus maniliformis, like we already mentioned with cat and sometimes, or rat and sometimes cat bites, so cats eat rats. So. Um, Pseudomonas, Aeromonas, and Vibrio are associated with marine bites, uh, marine species like sharks. Uh, but we also see it with fish. One of the questions on my exam, my infectious disease exam was of a, someone who was fishing in northern Ontario and got bitten by a pike, because they have really sharp, long teeth, and then got uh, an infection with erysipelothrix. That was a tricky one. <laughs> um, uh, Actinobacillus in horse and sheep bites. Herpes B virus infection, which can cause encephalitis, uh, is associated with certain types of monkeys, including the Sinomongolus macaques. Uh, Iconella and hepatitis B and potentially HIV with human bites. And then seal finger. I did my training in Newfoundland, and so seal finger was something I learned about there, and I don't think I've ever heard anyone talk about since. And it's, a, it's thought to potentially be due to mycoplasma uh, bacteria and it's associated with seal and fox bites or exposures. So people who butcher uh, seals or butcher foxes. There are a lot of things to know about bite wound management and you're, that isn't uh, work that you'll be doing but the, th the take home point I would like you to, to share because sometimes people will come to you with these kinds of complaints. I know because I've heard from other vets. Uh, is that really the, the basic advice should be always to clean the wound right away. Uh, think about uh, an prophylactic antibiotics, especially for cat bites or more severe bites or bites with, um, with uh, devitalized tissue, uh, and to, to pay close attention to, to these bites. Moving on from bites, there are other specific risks and emerging problems that we, we hear a lot about nowadays. Salmonella is one of the big ones, so that was the first case. There have been many outbreaks in North America in recent years, many in association with animals or animal-derived de foods like poultry, beef, air, eggs, and dairy. And there are specific animals that have been implicated with these salmonella outbreaks. In particular, uh, b poultry like baby chicks, uh, livestock, uh, reptiles, amphibians, and rodents. And so if you Google or do a PubMed search about, about salmonella outbreaks, you can see there's like lots and lots of them now. Local research here in Ontario has shown that dogs have a high rate of salmonella carriage. Uh, about a quarter of all dogs uh, and a quarter of all households with a dog had it, were, were found to be shedding it. And so this can, this can be a problem. Uh, and it's been statistically associated with, significantly associated with uh, uh, eating a raw food diet, especially raw eggs and raw meat, and having more than one dog in the household. So one more case, uh, a 48-year-old man with type 2 diabetes. I didn't see this one. This one was published. I don't do adults. Uh, a 48-year-old man with diabetes and chronic renal failure who's hospitalized with a right leg amputation wound infection uh, two months post-op. And the culture grew MRSA, uh, and he was treated. And he also had a nasal swab at the same time that was also positive for MRSA. So that suggests that not only did he have a current infection with MRSA, but he's also colonized with it which is probably why he got the infection in the first place. Uh, so the wound was treated with vancomycin for 10 days, and he also had a decolonization approach where he had chlorhexidine baths once a day, and he applied intranasal mupirocin. Uh, but the wound infection resolved, but the nasal culture remained positive for MRSA for some time. Uh, and so they tried again to eradicate it, and they still couldn't eradicate it. His wife, who also had health problems, a kidney transplant, uh, and type 2 diabetes, then developed cellulitis herself with MRSA. And she had a negative nasal culture. And so the doctors were stumped. They tried again and again to decolonize this family because they were getting repeated and serious infections, uh, and they weren't being successful. And usually we can eradicate. So they decided to get a nasal swab from the only other member of the household, who's a Dalmatian, and the culture revealed MRSA with the same susceptibility pattern <laughs> as the humans. Uh, and they also found that it was resistant to mupirocin, which we don't usually test for. And so uh, further history revealed that the dog routinely <coughs> slept with the humans and licked their faces. And so they prescribed vancomycin ointment to all the household members, including the dog, and finally led to uh, eradication. 
So MRSA in pets is increasingly being recognized as a problem, uh, including numerous ca Canadian reports, and you guys here in Guelph are uh, amongst the leaders in terms of uh, reporting this. Um, and so it's been associated with, uh, a there's a, an association of risk to uh, transmission to humans with horses, pigs, dogs, cats, and dolphins. And one recent US and Canadian study showed that 27% of households where an animal had a previous MRSA infection also found a human colonized with MRSA. And so this is an issue uh, in terms of trading pathogens back and forth within households. Um, there are many other scenarios where we think about pathogens and specific pets and, their, and risk of infection for humans. Dogs and cats can carry human pathogenic giardia and clostridium difficile. Uh, in Ontario and Quebec, 2 to 14 percent of dogs and 5 to 12 percent of cats carry Toxocara, uh, Canis, or cat eye in their stool. Barnyard animals can, have, uh, can carry a variety of pathogens. Here in Ontario, we're acutely aware of the risk of uh, cattle carriage of E. coli 157 due to the Walkerton uh, disaster uh, some years ago. Uh, but also with cattle, we think about Cryptosporidium and Salmonella. And rodents can have Salmonella. Uh, and also lympho lymphochorio meningitis virus, which can lead to congenital infection in babies uh, or, or meningitis in babies and, and adults. Um, and so what can vets do? So the, the, the title of this talk was, uh, how can we work together or what, how can we complement one another? And so from my perspective, I think it's important for you guys uh, when you see families, uh, I'm not sure how, how palatable it is to ask about the human household, the health of human household members, but I think it's reasonable to ask about high-risk household members. If there are young children or elderly, particularly compromised elderly patients, uh, immune compromised people who've had bone marrow transplants or kit, uh, solid organ transplants, uh, and also uh, pregnancy. Pregnancy is a time-limited uh, kind of condition, uh, but important to know about when it happens. And also uh, to ask about high-risk pets. Uh, ask these questions in relation to high-risk pets. So if someone's coming to you with their sick turtle or their sick rodent, maybe ask, is there anyone in the household that you'd be worried about having exposure to these patients, to, these to the, this pet? And, and when you find out about, uh, about these high-risk household members, or even not, because sometimes when you meet them <coughs> originally, there's no high-risk person, but someone in the household becomes high-risk. They become immune compromised due to the diagnosis of a new condition. Or there's a new baby that arrives in the family. So providing resources on good animal husbandry to reduce risk, for example, avoiding raw food diets, co-sleeping, uh, proper waste disposal, proper cage or other habitat cleaning, uh, I think is really important. And when the animal is ill with something that can affect humans, advise on infection control practices in the household. I think it's important to provide balanced advice though, uh, to balance the risks against the benefits uh, and avoid heavy handed messaging due to overreaction. So like in this, in this, uh, in one of my cases, the, the family went out and killed the cat. Uh, it was a feral cat and probably that's what ha would have happened anyway if they called animal control. Uh, but I've also seen it where I'm just asking questions about the potential for zoonotic infection in someone with an undiagnosed infection. And the next day I'll go back and the family will, will say, I got rid of the cat. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I didn't say to get rid of the cat. <laughs> uh, and so I think it's um, important to avoid heavy handed messaging uh, and make sure that they know uh, if there is a potential for infection, it's not the animal's fault. It's something that's, that they're colonized with, for example, with respect to salmonella and, and reptiles. And the best way to approach that is just to be careful and know what to avoid doing, not to get rid of the animal. Uh, it's also uh, good to use reasonable measures to reduce household risks. So avoid high risk interactions, like don't let a dog lick your Mitrofenov or, <laughs> or lick your central venous line. That, dogs do that. I mean, they're often mucky, those areas, and, and animals tend to you can tell me if I'm wrong, but t they tend to go for the smelly things and, and they like licking and, and rooting around in it. And so it's important to avoid those high-risk interactions, especially with high-risk humans, uh, and address any dangerous practices quickly. I always try to share with people that I think the pets are worth any risk that is there, the majority of them, like notwithstanding 300-pound boa constrictors in the house or crazy stuff like that. Uh, but 
on average, the average pet is, is worth more in terms of good health uh, outcomes than bad health outcomes. Uh, and it, it's, it's commonly known that, well, amongst uh, people who like pets, that there are lots of proposed benefits of pet ownership. Companionship is greatest amongst uh, pet owners. Uh, decreases in isolation, uh, particularly for people with mental health problems. Increased sense of social support. And also increased activity amongst pet owners. Uh, and we all need more exercise. Likewise, advice to remove a pet from the home from high-risk patients may well worsen their quality of life. And so you can imagine a, a child diagnosed with leukemia then is told you have to get rid of your cat. Like that's, that's not okay. And so I think we can all work together to advise pe people on how to reduce the risks rather than uh, reduce the pet contact. Uh, in terms of guidelines for immunocompromised patients in particular, there's few prescriptive guidelines in existence. Uh, general advice, like I said, is not to get a new pet after diagnosis. And if you, they are getting a new pet, to avoid higher risk pets like young ones, puppies and kittens. Uh, as they are higher risk uh, in terms of their behavior and the pathogens they carry, and also to avoid high-strung breeds of dogs. Uh, ensure the pet is examined by one of you guys and their vaccinations are up to date and to seek a pet's advice regarding risks. And there really are lots of resources. I frequently refer people to the Worms and Germs blog uh, from here at Guelph because I think it has a lot of excellent information and a lot of really niche information that's hard to find. Uh, the other one is the CDC website. Uh, so this is the Worms and Germs blog, which I'm sure most of you know already. And then the CDC website has this healthy pet, uh, healthy people um, section, uh, and they have a pet prescription where it has, uh, you can actually provide a prescription for what kinds of uh, precautions should be taken for different types of pets. So in summary, I think pets are potential sick, are potential sick contacts for humans presenting with infections. And it's important that we're aware of the risks with specific animals and attuned to the potential contribution of animal contacts to specific situations like immunocompromised patients. Uh, likewise, though, pets are a source of enjoyment for most people and careful attention to pet health maintenance, husbandry, and observation is key and can help avoid most of the, the potential downsides. And veterinarians should be considered a resource to human medical practitioners and vice versa. I reach out to you, uh, Andrew and Scott on a, on a regular basis uh, and they do the same with me and I think that's the way we should be having these kinds of discussions. I don't know anyone who wouldn't be open to that uh, uh, and I think we just need to make it known that we are interested in talking to one another. And that's it. And I'm happy to take any questions. It's just a very uh, fastidious organism. It's it has certain nutritional requirements that aren't uh, routine in the lab. Like when we're trying to grow regular bacteria, uh, this one is more difficult to grow. And so it required a lot of extra massaging and adding additional nutritional supplements to the culture media. Thanks. No, that's a very good question. Sometimes the, sometimes the, the patient is better informed than the physician, uh, and so that's not an uncommon thing. Uh, I think first I would maybe come equipped, so bring, the, bring something you read, because a lot of people, they don't know what they don't know uh, in terms of uh, human physicians. Um, and so that's, a, that's one way to say, actually, well, I, I think I'm legit. <laughs> I think what I have is a, is a genuine concern. Uh, ask for cultures, so, so there are tests that to be done. Many people use an empiric approach, like they, they, you say you have a cellulitis, they give you the cellulitis treatment, they don't do the swab to try and confirm what it is. And so that's another way, because if we can identify a zoonotic pathogen, then that's going to make, make the diagnosis uh, more readily than doing it from a syndromic approach. Um, the other thing I would say is, Try to find people who, who have an interest. So if you came to me with that, I'd be like all over it. Because 
I'm interested in this and I think that I have uh, probably a greater than average knowledge in terms of zoonotic infections. Um, and so finding physicians who have the same types of interests and the same types of bent uh, in terms of how they would work something up is, is a good thing. You never know who you're going to get in the eMERGE, uh, but I, th I think just like I know a few uh, vets in my community in Ottawa uh, who are interested in this kind of stuff and I could call on uh, if I wanted to get vets te uh, the pet in the household tested, uh, you, you could find human physicians in your community that are uh, going to have the same kind of uh, interest and increased knowledge. Thanks. That's a, that's a very common issue of, of insect, insect bites or stings in general uh, and having these rapid inflammatory responses. And most of the time when I hear about something like that when the eMERGE physician calls me, things tend to be less likely to progress that quickly with an infection uh, compared to an allergic reaction or a, like a uh, otherwise kind of uh, contact reaction to uh, to bites or stings, and so I'd be more inclined to, to lean on the non-infectious side, but most of the time we, we try to be cautious and, and treat anyway because we don't want to be wrong. <laughs> and something that progresses very quickly like that needs to be monitored very closely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we often never get a clear idea, but... Thanks. <laughs> 